Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Krista Vasquez with Corinium, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our next session, Operationalizing AI from Experimentation to Execution. Here to present this afternoon, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Atul, the VP of AI at Tavant. Atul, please join and turn on your camera, pop off mute, and I'm delighted to have you take our virtual stage. Welcome. Thank you, Krista, and hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. So just let me know if you can see my screen. I can see, it looks great. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So welcome to the session, uh, let's get started. So uh, adoption of AI and machine learning is on the rise in most industry segments. However, a hurdle that most enterprises experience in this adoption is in taking machine learning solutions from experimental stage that is from data scientists to prediction deployments, uh, basically through software engineering processes to deliver the promised business value. Machine learning engineering for production requires techniques and practical experti experience that trans transform theoretical machine learning knowledge into production ready and deployable solutions. Exp uh, expertise in machine learning concept is essential, but to build an effective AI program in enterprise requires somewhat different way of thinking and how such projects are run. For instance, running ML solutions in production requires ensuring that its performance remains useful as real world conditions change. Uh, for example, you know, the recommendation models built pre-pandemic probably performed very poorly during the pandemic due to the changes in the people's shopping patterns. So the need to monitor the model's performance in production uh, deployment is critical and to update the model so as to keep up the level of business value it delivers. Finally, data, science ex data scientists are, are expensive. So increasing their productivity through use of methodologies to direct their efforts productively is important. For instance, deep learning AI mentions that they increase the productivity for one of their clients, actually Spotify by seven times. 7x, which is by no means a small number, seven times through adopting such methods. So what I'm going to cover in this talk, uh, based, based on how much time we have, uh, what I'm going to cover is that there are best practices for all phases of machine learning solution development. I've picked a few for this talk today, considering the ones which are generally overlooked as well as considering the impact they bring to the overall process. Okay, so next three slides are more about introspection to, for all the audience. So let's start uh, by asking ourselves these questions. By the way, these issues, uh, these are the issues we come across when we speak with data scientist teams in a lot of well-established enterprises. As I mentioned, the adoption of ML is increasing. And in 2021, uh, at least the industry experts say that, that in 2021, the emphasis is going to be on developing processes and methodologies for ML projects so that they are run as efficiently as regular software projects. And these questions signify the reason why such an effort is required. So things like knowing what all models have been deployed in our kit, is, is, there, is there that information available easily? Being able to replicate the results of some models deployed a few months back clear definition of responsibilities for development of machine learning models and running and maintaining them in production, methodologies for monitoring the performance of models and refreshing them, alignment between ML scientists, uh, uh, their, their modeling objectives and business objectives they're required to bring. In fact, I'll talk a lot about this one. Explainability of the model's output to make sense to the domain experts and so on and so forth. My hope is that a lot of you had good answers to these questions, but generally speaking, the answers to these questions that we have heard are not very satisfying. And it's not our judgment, it is when we talk to such kind of teams, they themselves share that, look, we don't have very good answers to these questions. And th this, these, uh, this is indicative of lack of rigorous formalism in the various elements of ML projects. Uh, from data management aspects, 
to building of models, baselining the performance, tracking experiments, and extremely important business validation of the results, thinking, about, thinking around tools and automation, appropriate way of deploying very different kind of ML models in production. Yes, there are different ways and, and, and different deployment techniques are, are useful for different kinds of models. We'll talk about that. Monitoring their performance while in production and various aspects of governance. Now, these elements are the way I've, I've mentioned are high level items, but as you peel the onion, a lot of details come out which need to be addressed. Okay, we are continuing with the introspection. So, you know, one can also ind indicatively evaluate the maturity level of the way the ML projects are run. So level zero are basically in the initial stages of development, uh, of developing such kind of uh, uh, pro projects. A lot of companies we have spoken with are at this level, by the way. So what, what are the characteristics? Generally involves a lot of manual processes, not a formal or well-defined interface between data scientists and operations, uh, and few other things, but very importantly, lack of continuous monitoring of models performance in production. Then comes level one. Level one is where, you know, where well-established data science teams consider themselves to be within a short time, maybe six months or a year from today. And some have actually gotten there. So that is generally uh, the, the state of affairs with level one. So well-established data science teams are, are near that. And uh, basically what are the characteristics that generally tools are seen to be in place, which lead to some level of formalism as a consequence of using those tools, but still requires more deliberateness in setting, setting up the best practices. What you normally observe in such kind of uh, level is experiments turn around uh, are faster due to the tools. Model monitoring basics are in place, such as logging. Modularization and reuse is helping with productivity and continuous delivery is either easily possible based on the infrastructure they have or is already in place. Finally, level two, this is the level where most best practices are identified and institutionalized. And we believe that not many enterprises are this level yet, but those companies which have ML as their core business or those enterprises who have a, who lay a strong emphasis on using machine learning and AI for their, for, for, uh, for their solutions, for their decision-making those are generally expected to be near this level or perhaps actually there. Okay, after taking you through this introspection, let me go over some ideas about what it takes to get, a, to get better at op operationalizing AI solutions. So first of all, they have been very well understood and widely followed methodologies for software development. For ML projects, these become the basis and need to be adapted further to meet the specific needs of such projects. That's why the statement that I'm showing on the screen says that the statement is to combine ML methodologies with software engineering principles. That is, adapt the software engineering practices to meet the needs of machine learning solution development such that it leads to production grade machine learning based solutions. So as we implied in the previous slides, currently ML methodologies are mostly being force-fitted into the traditional software engineering practices, which definitely needs to change. The good thing is that now there are enough thought process and in industry literature which deals with this, and frameworks, are, frameworks exist, which can be used as a starting point to formulate your team's best practices. In the subsequent slides, I aim to give an overview of those frameworks and highlight a few key ideas. And I will pick, uh, pick only a small number of them, uh, which we believe are important, but are likely to be overlooked. And I, I'll try to keep everything in time. Therefore, that's why I'm picking up only some small uh, you know, tips and tricks that I'll talk about. So from data science, uh, data scientists uh, perspective, the world revolves around machine learning code and model development, right? However, 
for productionizing these models, there's a lot more that needs to be considered. This uh, visual that I'm showing here just shows the magnitude of the elements involved beyond the machine learning model or code, but it does not depict how the practices of each of these two colored boxes needs to be adapted to have a harmonized way of integrating the two sides into one common and consistent set of practices that work well. Okay, so let's take a peek into the framework template we follow at Tavant. As you can see, there's a lot of detail here, but for this discussion, I want you to take away two very specific points. First, you can see that broadly, a typical ML project can be divided into four phases. Firstly, definition of the business problem. What is the business outcome to be achieved? Then the data phase, acquiring, enriching, labeling, analyzing the data, and making it ready for machine learning modeling process. Then the whole process of modeling where data scientists do their magic. Finally, deployment and monitoring. This one is easy to be considered as mundane, but is indeed at the heart of success of solutions. And we'll talk a bit more about it later on in this talk. So this was the first takeaway that there are four phases. The other takeaway is the iterative nature of such kind of projects. You see a number of arrows going backwards in the flow. I have highlighted them in orange color. For instance, the modeling and data phase go back and forth. This is essential as improving the model's performance must involve improving the data, basically enhancing, enriching, and augmenting the data. The fact is that better algorithms contribute less to better, to, to better models than good data does. And that's, that's, an, that's, that's a fact that is, that's something that definitely needs to be taken into consideration as we, we think about how our project will, will be executed, will run. Another uh, iterative nature is the arrow from model monitoring all the way back to data and modeling phases. This is because the performance of the model is expected to degrade with time because the ground realities actually evolve. So the, the way the model was trained and the outputs that it is giving can become obsolete with time. Hence, refreshing and retraining the model is an essential part of the framework. Okay, now this was pretty detailed, but it helps to see the framework in a much more simplified form to have a handle on what all it entails. And this is a good reference to use as you develop your own template for your projects. Okay, let's talk about each of those, each of those in, in uh, details. So the first one is scoping. And, and you know, I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because this is, this is crucial. So first step is scoping. So the first point is obvious. What is the business objective to be met? And then what are the data inputs for the prediction? This requires domain expertise. When a model is required to predict something, it needs to know what is the basis, what are the factors that it should take into consideration to make that prediction. And that generally comes from domain experts. Therefore, identifying what factors actually play a role in making that prediction is paramount. And for instance, in, in uh, making a prediction about risk, riskiness of a loan, you would need to know what are the income, what is the price of the house, what are the credit rating, what is the uh, loan to value ratio, and so on and so forth. So those factors which the model should be trained on needs to be elaborate, needs to be known so that the model can actually be trained to be effectively, uh, to, to, to give some good predictions. Availability of that kind of data for histor historical data to be able to train the model is important. And not only that, we, you should also take into consideration that as you've got the model, uh, as you've got the data and you've created a model, it is quite likely that you will have to go back and, and get more data because it turns out that the data is either underrepresenting something or, or is, 
the, the kind of, of categories of, of, of the, the data rows that you've got are not conducive to training for a certain category of outcomes. So you'll have to go back and pick up more data, more different kinds of data, and that should be something that should be taken into account as you plan for your project. Then the key metri metrics like accuracy, latency, throughput. Accuracy is something tricky and we'll come back to that as we talk about the modeling itself, but it's important to come up with some accuracy targets and that, in, that uh, requires some informed uh, decision about how to even come up with what should be the accuracy targets. And we'll talk about that on the slide itself in a few minutes. And then of course, estimating resource entitlement. The second phase, as we talked about, is data. And this basically deals with collecting or acquiring data. Volume and quality of data is very important. And then comes organizing and, label and labeling the data and validate consistency of that labeling. This is, this is, this is critical. The, you, you, there are some cases where the label of the data is unambiguous and you can, you can always make sure that if correctly labeled, the, you, you would have the same label for a given input. However, many times it occurs, it happens that there are two very reasonable ways of labeling the data, the same data, and those are, and, and your, the data that you have has a mix of those two different kinds of labeling techniques or multiple kinds of labeling uh, techniques. That, is so the labeling is not wrong, just that it is inconsistent. And that leads to not very good uh, performance from the model. So for instance, uh, in, in a, in a uh, voice recognition example, you can think of uh, you know, when, how the person is speaking, do you want to code for the, the ums and ahs as, you, as you're transcribing, or you do not want to? Both are reasonable, but you need to stick with one consistent way of doing that. So that becomes very important and having that kind of consistency in labeling is very important. Enriching, augmenting, enhancing data, that's the other, other element of the data phase. Uh, augmenting is basically required when you have certain kind of data that is not, which is not very well represented. So either you will try to acquire the data or maybe you'll do some techniques to augment the data. And then, which I mentioned earlier also, and I think I'll repeat it multiple times, iteratively improve data in conjunction with the modeling effort. Getting good quality data is, is, is super important because that's what will drive the accuracy of your models. Then the modeling itself, establishing a baseline. The idea here is that you don't really need to always think of 90, 95%, 98% accuracy. It all depends on the use case. For instance, if you're trying to predict what is the likelihood of somebody refinancing a loan? The industry standard today is based on the techniques that they're using and, and pretty good techniques that they're using today is about 18% recapture rate. That means they're able to hold back 18% of the people who actually refinance. If you can improve through your machine learning models that to 30%, 40%, you have already, that, that itself is already a pretty good target to have. You don't have to really think of 90, 95% because that in such kind of use cases will be not only unrealistic, it will basically be completely unfeasible. Then the, then, the top, then the second point is about trap of lower rate, but not good enough for business. That is quite a few times, the machine learning scientists will tell you that, look, I have got very high accuracy rates, but it turns out that Supposing you have 20% of your customers that give that generate 80% of your revenue, then you would want that whatever be the accuracy for those 20% of your customers, the accuracy should be very high. And you're willing to tolerate lower accuracy as long as those 20 customers, those 20% those customers, uh, you know, the model performs very well for them. So that, that is another important element to think of when you're modeling. Then error analysis analysis for uh, directing the effort of the, of the machine learning scientists and better data beats better algorithms. I think I'll keep repeating this over and over because this is crucial. This is something that gets overlooked 
many, many times, but this is a very important fact that getting good data is better than getting very top-notch algorithms. For deployment, I'll skip uh, on this slide because I'll be talking about this in more details, but this is, this, these are very simple points, nothing very, nothing very uh, earth shattering, but having thought of those is very important about how do you, how do you deploy, what, what is the way that you cut over your, your model and how do you monitor? Okay, so let me start with the very first point, which is about uh, selecting the business problem. You should avoid the trap of trying to, trying to think of a, a problem which is, a, which is best solved through rule-based. So if, if there's something that you already know how to, how to make a, a decision about, because it's, you, and it's more of a policy-based thing, you better, it's not worthwhile to use machine learning for that. When you have to make, a, when you have to learn what decisions to make, which will improve your business decisions, that is where you need to use machine learning model because it'll look at the data, try to find out how to make decisions which eventually lead to higher business value. So machine learning is all about extracting knowledge from data and therefore making predictions while rule-based techniques are, they may be very complex in nature, but they are basically well-defined and you can just compute those by using algorithms. Machine learning's most realistic use cases are those which you, human experts can do because that helps you with feasibility, that helps you with creating training data, as I mentioned, because a lot of data, a lot of decision about what is relevant data for that problem comes from domain experts. And also domain insights helps in doing error analysis to drive progress. And anything that a human expert can decide in several minutes, based on today's uh, state of the art, that is a good problem to try to solve by machine learning. And uh, the business problem where you can have data of good volume and of good, good quality is very important to take into consideration before you decide that you want to have a project to solve that kind of a business problem through machine learning. Then the concept drift and data drift. This is, a, this, the, the point is that once you have created a, a machine learning model, it will degrade over time. And why does that? Because the kind of data that you had originally trained on, that kind of data is no more aware. The, the kind of data that you're getting in production is different from that kind. Maybe you trained it on certain kind of demographics, but the, but you are now using this model on a very different kind of a demographic or a different region. So those kind of things can happen. So the data itself that you're feeding to the model can be different. The other part is concept drift, where the predictions that you had to make are now obsolete. Those predictions don't, don't matter. For instance, behavior of online shoppers might change over time as preferences change, or they may change suddenly as the example I gave you earlier of when I was talking about the, the pandemic, the, the change in people's behavior during, during the pandemic. So the kind of recommendations that you would have to make would be very different. So the, the concept it is, itself has changed. For instance, grading of manufacturing defects to minor, medium, or outright rejected might change if you are addressing different market and you can sell the same product at a different price points. So the way the, the defects need to be categorized can change. So those are the things that require upgrading a model. And how do you do that? You can look at looking at the accuracy of the model, but that's not always feasible. So what you do is you look at the distribution of the input values and distribution of the output values and see if there is a major change in those. The distribution of the various factors that are input to the model, is it very different from the inputs that I fed when I was training the model? Similarly, the output of the of the, the distribution of the uh, of the output of the model means the categorization that it is doing, for instance, was earlier mostly 60% was of one category, 40% was of the other. Now has it changed significantly? Those kind of things are indications that you should take a look at a deeper look into the model's performance. And this, this, these parameters to model are uh, to, to monitor are very use case dependent. And uh, so you need to do a lot of brainstorming on what to look for when you're doing that kind of uh, assessment. And then once you, once you determine 
that the model needs to be refreshed, there are two options. Either you do manual retraining, which is the most common way of doing it, but you can also use automated retraining, which is very rarely used for a good reason. But there are some cases where you can use automatic retraining. Then the final point I want to make is about uh, the deployment patterns. These are again very simple ideas, but very effective. So first is shadow deployment, where the human continues to make a decision, but you use machine learning model to make its prediction, but just log it. Don't use that prediction to make a decision, but just log it. And that basically helps you evaluate the model's performance in real life. In real life, when the real life data is being fed to it, how does it perform? So that's a very, and so you can roll out if you feel that the, the, if you evaluate that the predictions that the model is making are pretty good. And then the canary deployment, where you take a model and feed only a small fraction of data to it. And using that, it makes decisions. And even if it is not performing very well, you basically affect only a small amount of your traffic. And uh, you know it works very well for the cases where visual defect, uh, cases like visual defects detection, where you can immediately assess whether the, the whether the prediction was good or bad. But when cases where the the observation takes very long for you to make a judgment whether the prediction is good or bad, you need to go back to the the points that I made earlier in the previous slide of monitoring other parameters to make a judgment about model's performance. Blue-green deployment is where you want to bring in a new model and just tra transfer all the traffic to it. And if things don't go well, you, you switch back to the old model. But the most, if most common way and most effective way of doing it is when you actually evolve the degree of automation gradually. So first it was only human, then you go to shadow mode, then you go to assistant where the model's prediction become a, a, a suggestion to the human expert that I think this is the error, or I think this should be the prediction and the human can, can override it or actually make the decision. Then partial where you put the human only for exception cases, when the predictions are with high confidence, you actually make those decisions automatically. But if the confidence is low, you pass them on to a human expert to make those decisions. And once everything is working well and you have established that the, that the model is performing well, you get into a full automation means the, all the decisions are being made by the model. Those are the kind of things I wanted to cover today. Uh, open for some questions and answers now. Wonderful session. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. We actually do have a couple of questions. We have two minutes left, so we'll see if we can get through get through them both. Um, the first. To operationalize AI in regulated industries, you need to demonstrate there is no bias. What ways are effective for handling that? Yeah, th that, is, that is true. For regulated industries, it's very important that they follow compliance and they avoid any bias in their predictions. And the bias can occur for multiple reasons. You know, they can be the data that you used uh, was biased because, because the source of the data itself Maybe you took the data uh, from, from a source where it represented only certain kind of cases. So that can be another bias. So, so bias can occur for multiple reasons. So it, it is, you know, there are multiple ways of trying to avoid bias. First thing that comes to mind is explainability. If you can, if you can reason about why the model came up with a certain prediction, you can go, you can actually have a domain expert look at it and say, well, if, if the reason is because of gender or because of ethnicity, there is definitely bias in the model. And then you can actually go back to the model and retune it so that you can avoid those kind of biases. And there are many techniques through which you can do that. You can neutralize such kind of biases. If you know what bias you need to neutralize, there are lots of techniques available where you can do that, right? The other is, and the more I think appropriate one is, be very careful of how you collect the data. How, what kind of data that you're using and do a lot of analysis on the data before you even get to the modeling phase to see if the data itself represents a lot of bias in it. I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. You're getting lots of accolades as well um, in the presentation. So, th so thank you. Thank you again. Last question and then we will wrap. There are a number of auto ML tools available and are getting better by the day. So why is automated retraining not common? 
Yeah, so I actually mentioned in, in, on one of my slides that auto, uh, automatic retraining is rare. So the, the reason for that is, is, actually, is actually straightforward. But first of all, full credit to the AutoML techniques that are coming around. They, they are really getting better by the day and they can take a lot of load off the data scientists and take away the, the, the drudgery of trying to check which models are performing better and so on and so forth. However, the, the more important element, and that again, you know, gets back to the same point that I made multiple times earlier, the data, having good data is, is extremely important. So even though you got some data and you trained a model and you could actually come up with a reasonably good model, perhaps you can improve that if you improve, if you improve the quality of data that you have. So this back and forth between the modeling doing error analysis, and then going back and improving your data, then going back again to doing modeling, doing error analysis, and then going and improving that. That cycle makes it a, a, a little more prone to a manual approach rather than automatic approach. Wonderful, thank you. We got one more. Um, I'm gonna hold you for one more minute if that's okay. Um, this one from Su Yu Hao in the audience. Can you give us some insights as cloud native ML ops? Sure. So that, that's, that's the great part. Uh, I didn't talk about any tools today, but all the major cloud platforms have pretty decent and pretty good set of tools that enable uh, such kind of oper operationalizing of or automating or basically MLOps techniques. So the SageMaker, Azure ML, what have you, they'll be on Google Cloud. So what have you, all these cloud platforms they are great, they provide great set of tools and are great vehicles to implement your best practices or evolve your best practices using those tools. And those will actually help you a lot in saving uh, your, your uh, in, in speeding up your project execution, in making your data scientists more efficient and coming up with very good models which have very high performance. Great, thank you so much. Hope that answered your question out there. Um, so that will do it for our session this afternoon. Thank you, Atul and your team at Tavant for joining us.